The King of New Orleans. By Greg Klein. Prologue. Man of the People. When the junkyard dog appeared on the Mid-South wrestling scene, Tanya Dauphine was a ten-year-old living in the projects of St. Bernard Parish, just southeast of New Orleans. Everyone in her family watched wrestling, and she is what you would call a casual fan. She doesn't remember specific matches, and can't name any of the other wrestlers from that era without prompting. But she remembers one thing. When the kids would go out back after the show and play wrestling, she would only be one wrestler. I was the junkyard dogs and the round middle-aged, dark-skinned woman with a spiderweb tattoo on her chest. It was my name. I always had to be the junkyard dog. Dauphine wasn't alone in emulating JYD, and her reasons weren't at all unique. It was the way he used to wrestle, she explained. He won all his matches. Dauphine was one of many people I talked to while looking for JYD fans on the streets of New Orleans. I started my search by using the internet and posting classified ads, but neither had worked. For whatever reason, Craigslist was a bomb, and even the wrestling and social media websites weren't helping me connect with fans. So, I decided to take to the streets. It was either an attempt at old school, shoe leather reporting or, appropriately, like a JYD-style wrestling vignette. I headed to the Central Business District, CBD, to see if I could find fans of JYD simply by asking people about him. It didn't take long. The CBD is what other cities might call a downtown. It is adjacent to the French Quarter, and is a hub of legal and commercial activity. I walked around for several hours, finding fans at every turn. This city loved him, says Gregory Bradley. Wrestling here went down without him. A native of rural Bogalusa, Louisiana, Bradley now works at Frederick's Deli, on the famous St. Charles Avenue. I caught him on his smoke break, just as he was finishing up a mini cigar. When I asked him if he knew who the junkyard dog was, he responded Sylvester Ritter, and lit up a second smoke. Bradley started watching Mid-South Wrestling when he was six, and remembers JYD from his earliest days, even before he returned from Calgary with a push. I remember when he was a bad wrestler, when he lost like 30 matches in a row. Then all of a sudden he started coming to the ring with that wheelbarrow and teaming with Buck Robley. It was like he never lost again. The fans loved him so much. He turned good, and the rest is history. Bradley said that feuds with Ernie Ladd and the Freebirds stuck out most in his mind. When I asked him about the Butch Reed era and the heated rhetoric Reed used, he was straightforward, that was just two brothers hating on each other. It happens a lot. That's all I saw with that. Another feud had a bigger effect on him. Ted DiBiase, now that's the one that broke my heart. I mean, your best friend, the best man at your wedding. How do you go and turn on him like that? Actor and producer Clyde R. Jones had a different take on the Reed feud. You know, everybody knows if two black people use the N-word with one another we don't take it personally. But there is still a line. Butch Reed crossed the line. I think that was the point. They wanted people at home to take notice to say, wow, he really stepped over the line there. It became personal. And I think the point was to make it personal to the fans, too. Like, he really cut into my skin there. Roger Dickerson remembers JYD's feud with Ernie Ladd for its intensity. Ernie Ladd, that was the one, he said. I don't know what it was, but those two couldn't get along for nothing. Dickerson grew up in the Jefferson Parish suburb of Avondale, and now runs his own business, Unlimited Concrete and Restorations. He remembers going to many matches at the downtown municipal auditorium as a kid with his uncle. It was fun. It was just a thrill to be there. I remember one time I actually met Junkyard Dog. He shook my hand. I was never the same after that. Despite rumors to the contrary, no one I talked to described the auditorium as dangerous, even though it may have been in a bad part of town and the crowd could be aggressive. Some of the fans were violent toward the wrestlers, said BJ LeBlanc of Marrero, Louisiana. I remember seeing wrestlers burned with cigarettes, fans pulling knives. And back in the day, if you told somebody wrestling was fake, you'd better be ready to fight. Still LeBlanc and the others who attended the matches remember the auditorium as a good place to watch wrestling. I used to go with my brother-in-law and we would take a co-worker of his who was black so no one would bother us, said LeBlanc. But nobody did bother us, anyway. Even back then, everybody went to the matches. LeBlanc's interest in wrestling predates Mid-South and even Tri-State, and goes back to outlaw groups that used to run matches at a gym on Jefferson Parish's West Bank. He went to matches at the Auditorium, the Superdome, and the Lakefront Arena. He admits that he preferred going to the modern Lakefront Arena, but he liked watching matches at the Auditorium, as well. The Superdome wasn't so great, he said. It was harder to see the matches. I guess it was more the thrill of being there and seeing the big matches. Unlike the rest of the fans I interviewed, LeBlanc had other favorites besides Junkyard Dog, 
His all-time top act was the Rock and Roll Express. Still, he cheered for all the good guys, and was a big fan of the dog. Junkyard Dog was everybody's favorite. Everybody loved him. It was just the right mix, right personality, right guy. No one even saw the color of his skin. Jones seconded that assessment. He wasn't successful because he was a black man. You didn't even see black, you just saw JYD. Jones's statement echoed in my head. It was the same sentiment that Sylvester Ritter's junior high football coach expressed to me the previous summer. With JYD, promoter Bill Watts and company had experimented with making a black man the unquestioned star of the show. Some viewed it as a bold move, but most just recognized it for what it was, good business. I hadn't told Jones about Grizzly Smith's prophetic words from 1978, but he nearly nailed them anyway. I learned a long time ago, Jones said, Green Talks. You can have a black guy on the street or some guy who isn't a big star and he may be black to folks. But you take Eddie Murphy, he's not black to people, he's just Eddie Murphy. It was the same way with JYD. He was just a star. You know Rocky was popular back then, too. He was the ethnic hero and people loved their ethnic heroes. Junkyard Dog was our Rocky. It may be harder, even in today's multimedia world, for a black man to cross over, but once you do, you can do anything. Junkyard Dog was everybody's hero. Everybody wanted him to win. Added Dickerson, whatever it was, it sure worked. I can remember going to the auditorium and standing in line for hours. People would get there early because it would sell out. They must have sold a lot of tickets. They did, of course, sell a lot of tickets. On an unscientific estimate, they sold a million in New Orleans alone over a five-year period, almost all thanks to JYD's success. When he left, the era was almost immediately over. For a lot of the New Orleans fans, wrestling has never been the same. I still follow it, said LeBlanc. I'll probably watch it later tonight. But it's different. I liked it more back then. It was more realistic. When I asked why they liked Junkyard Dog, they all had similar responses. He won all his matches, said Dickerson. That's why I liked him. It was just his style. And it never took him very long, either. Many of the people I interviewed, like Bradley, connected with JYD's persona in the ring, you knew you were in trouble when he started barking and running around. And then the big thump, once he put that on you, that was it. It used to make me so mad, Bradley continued, that they could only beat him by cheating. Of course if JYD's success had all been in the booking, Watts should have been able to repeat it with Butch Reed or Iceman Parsons or one of the other, more pathetic replacements. Many of these substitutes have been forgotten. When I mentioned their names, more than one fan broke out in laughter. Hardly a conversation I had ended without dipping into the tragic aspects of Sylvester Ritter's story, the post-WWF years, the drug addiction, the details of his death. More than one person asked, he's dead now, right? And forgotten, I wanted to add. Listening to people talk about the junkyard dog is real, about his feuds as if they were real, and, of course, about their real emotions when they saw and remembered him, has been an inspiration. Sylvester Ritter and the character he became, the Junkyard Dog, is in danger of being forgotten in wrestling circles, and in New Orleans. I want to change that. I want us to remember him. I want New Orleans to remember him. I want his fans to remember him.